In the name of the true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If only, if only I were a capable wife. That's my takeaway from Proverbs. Proverbs sets the bar not here, not here, but all the way up here sets a bar not only for what it means to be a capable wife, but to be a fully engaged human being participating in the kingdom of God. If only I were a capable wife. It's what I think Jesus might have hoped his disciples were thinking when he was explaining to them, yes, yet again, about what must happen. Again, we encounter a moment where Jesus and his disciples are moving, and in the context of that moving, Jesus lays out what it means to be the Son of Man. It means that he will be betrayed into human hands, and he will be killed, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But as the Gospel of Mark tells us, they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. How awkward must that have been? How many silent gestures and knowing looks were they trying to send as they followed him along the journey, and how did it go from their fear and their silence and their subtle cues to arguing about who was the greatest? If only they were capable wives. If only they had Right, the Christian scriptures version of the book of Proverbs, the letter of James, to guide them. Right, James tells us, for where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. If only they had understood that. I have many different thoughts about how this argument was playing out with the disciples, right? Scripture gives us the arguing about who was the greatest, but what does it mean to be the greatest, right? Is it the person who sits on the right-hand side of Jesus? Is it the person who gets to hold the common purse? Is it the person who, I don't know, adapts the mannerisms, but maybe not the spirit of Jesus, but somehow looks most like him. Or, and this is my personal favorite, is it the person who was vying to speak on Jesus' behalf when Jesus wasn't there? Who somehow or another, although that's not the way things were structured, wanted to be Jesus' chief of staff. 
right? The go-to person, the person who has all the answers, the person who is next up. The person who is next up, but apparently with none of the substance that would have gotten them there. Jesus, being Jesus, knows what the argument is about and responds, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then what I really wanted was a dictionary definition of what he meant. So what I'm saying is, I would like you to take on humility. What I am saying is, I would like you to know it's not about you. So what I'm saying is, you need to chill. So what I'm saying is, would you go back to Proverbs and reflect on some of that? So what I'm saying is, you're just not there yet. But that's not what we get. Instead, we we get this moment which, at least for me, and I'm a person who enjoys specificity. Everyone up here who works alongside me, deep down inside is laughing because that's the understatement of the world. As a person who enjoys a level of detail and specificity and clear direction, this moment where Jesus is incredibly oblique, I find very challenging. In answer to greatest and last and first, in answer to a misunderstanding of the kingdom of God, he takes a little child and he puts it among them and takes the child in his arms and he says to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. And it's as clear as mud. And I was listening very carefully to last week's sermon from the rector, and so I understand we're supposed to be figuring out who Jesus says Jesus is, and who we're supposed to understand Jesus is in our own lives, and this is not helpful. So let me just offer up this moment that occurred to me this week. I was traveling on the subway, as one does in this great city of ours. And for those of you joining us online, just imagine thinly veiled chaos with many, many people who are your friends and are not yet your friends. So I'm on the subway, and I'm traveling Midtown. Midtown, for us and for the rest of the world now described, is that place where the subway is really, really, really far from the surface of the city. Midtown is where you practically need a plane, train, and automobile to get from where the subway let you off up to street level. So I'm on my way, and because it's that particular time in New York, it's that particular season, the fourth level of the subway is about 25 degrees hotter than what it was before you went down in the subway. And I'm getting there, and the escalator does not work. And I happen upon this family, a very freshly minted family, who have a very, very small child in a very complicated stroller. And they are standing there at the base of this escalator that does not work, and they're having that moment, right? That moment that says, we have not slept in days or weeks. We cannot handle this. What could we possibly do? And so, I've been there. I walked up to them, and I offered to help carry the stroller up the many levels. I know all of us here would be willing to do that. 
and they looked at me, and I think they recognized the gestures that I was making, but there must have been some sort of language barrier that I didn't immediately catch on to because they looked at each other, the mother reached in the stroller, handed me the baby, <laughs> and they started marching the stroller up the stairs. Now, I've seen a lot of things in New York, but I was not expecting that. Right? And you know there's that moment where you receive the baby like this, but you know you are morally obligated to figure out a way to bring the baby here because you're a caring, feeling person. Right? So I received this unexpected delivery, and we had a little moment, this baby and I. Right? Eye to eye, stranger to stranger. And we started up the steps, the escalator steps, which you know are not evenly spaced when it's frozen in time. I have not in a great many years paid such careful attention to where my feet were and what I was carrying. There was a very real moment when the vulnerability of that child and the trust of those people was so profound that I was almost brought to tears. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. I have carried that moment. since it happened like it was that child. I held that moment gently when on Thursday morning, I spent time in our Compassion Market where we meet over 500 families, families overburdened with a change in circumstance, families overwhelmed by all that is happening, families exhausted by their journey to be our newest New Yorkers, families carrying things that I cannot imagine, and families full of little children. If we are being asked to understand who Jesus says that he is, he is there. If we are being asked to respond in a way that indicates our understanding and commitment as followers of Christ, it too is there. As we treat the most vulnerable among us, as we look into their eyes, as we carry them physically and metaphysically with us along the way, We are living into what the disciples do not understand just yet.
they do, eventually. How do we carry that out into the world so that it too might understand who we are, who the child is, who we're welcoming, who we love, and why we choose to be last so that the most vulnerable might be first. Amen.